Okay, then. Um, wow, this makes me feel powerful. Um, so, yeah, hands full. But I think I'll start off with a short story. Um, can we get the presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, I'd, well, first, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, so, it's, I'm, it's the first time I've heard of TEDx. Um, and I jumped on the opportunity. I felt like there was something I needed to talk about. Um, so, we'll begin. So yeah, I'm going to start with a story. Um, it's the perfect democratic ideal of the American dream, from rags to riches. Imagine a young man, a young African-American man, in the 1970s in New York City. He lives in a sixth floor apartment on East 94th Street, a drug-ridden neighborhood filled with gunshots. He fights it again to college in Los Angeles, Occidental College. His mother calls him in 1982 and tells him that he probably shouldn't party so much. So he moves back to New York City, where he graduates from Columbia University with a major in political science. Afterwards, a church-based organization in Chicago hires him to help disadvantaged African Americans. Maybe here he realizes that he can't solve the problem on a local level. And so he goes to Harvard Law School. After receiving his JD in 1991, he returns to Chicago, where he teaches constitutional law at the University of Chicago for 14 years. During this time, he acts on the Illinois State Senate. Then he becomes the third African-American to be voted to the United States Senate by popular vote, only the third. And then in 2008, he decides that he should run to be president of the United States. This president today had his setbacks and his challenges. But the ability to go from lower middle class to the president of the United States is a concept that we like to call social mobility that a lot of people interpret to be the American dream. So I'm going to assume that some of you people should know who this is. It's Barack Obama, who started as a poor boy in New York City, gets his degree um, in political science from Columbia University, goes to Harvard Law School, and becomes the President of the United States. So for those of you not exactly familiar with what the American Dream is, here's a definition from Mary Webster, but no one actually listens to that. They know it as social mobility and the idea for prosperity. However, I'd like to add a little bit to that definition. It's political, educational, cultural, social, everything, intellectual, that sort of freedom that people come to the United States for, not just the economic. It, if, that was, if economic was the only reason, people would all be flocking to China. However, there's something rather unfortunate that a lot of people don't want to hear. The American dream is failing. And, well, a lot of you might wonder why, or I'm sure a lot of you have heard reasons why. But the point is, one of the reasons why the American dream is failing is the government itself. The internal conflict with the government, known by a lot of people as Republicans, Democrats, no one can agree. So the bipartisan nature of the United States, at the moment at least, is hurting political freedom by only allowing two major groups, and although they are the major groups in the United States, there is a lack of minority representation. I don't see any Asian Americans in Congress. And maybe that's a little bit too much to expect because we are a minority. But in, in America, where you're supposed to assume, or you're, you're allowed to assume, that you're going to be represented, 
Where are my people? The dual party system, as I've already said, it attacks the efficacy of the United States, attacks the efficacy of the government itself. It prevents anything from happening. And if it does, it's so jumbled that no one really understands. Healthcare, for example. One in addition, there are too many politicians. And there's a difference between what you might think of a politician and what I think of as a politician. I think of as a politician as a greasy slime ball who doesn't really care about what you want, and he wants to hold on to his job. So where are the leaders who actually care about your idea and not his job? So I'm going to continue with the second reason, which is the manipulation of education. I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with Hosni Mubarak, um, the Egyptian dictator who ruled in Egypt for 30 years. And here's a reason why. He destroyed the Egyptian educational system by systematically de-educating a, a lot of his followers. He was able to rule because everyone was uneducated, everyone, no one knew how to get back at him until recently where there, was an, where there was an allowance for social media, where there's an allowance for people to actually start to understand what he was doing. And as controversial as this is, I say the United States does something a little bit like that. So, if you're going to say systematic de-education, and you're saying, oh, Hosni Mubarak, awful person, he ruled for 30 years, and although he was great for United States political affairs, he was just a bad person. How is the United States any different? There are continuous cuts to education every day. Governor Corbett will be one example. And why are we cutting education when the United States clearly lacks the same education system as Korea's like Finland and South Korea? In Finland and South Korea, teachers are nation builders. They're not just people in the workforce. They're people, that develop the, they're people that develop the next leaders. They're people that develop the future of their nations. President Lee Myung-bak of South Korea says, the problem with education is that parents care too much about their children's success. We, re, we saw a presentation earlier about how um, Chinese parents can sometimes be too involved. And sometimes that is a problem but that's why sometimes children are successful. Where is the involvement of the people? Where are the people saying we need to stop preventing, we need to prevent de-education? So, in order to combat these things, this is what I think we need. We need leaders that are brave enough to say, yes, there are people out there that have better ideas than I do, and I'm sure a lot of you out there have better ideas than I do right now. However, without, if you if you're, have a leader that isn't going to admit that he's wrong, where are we ever going to get right? It's difficult for American, It's difficult for America to progress if they think they're the best. You can't assume you're the best at everything or you're going to get nowhere. And from what I stand, I still see that a lot of people still think America's on top. And although that might be true in the economy, who knows for how long? We need leaders who are not politicians. We need leaders who actually care about what you think. I'm not saying that not all politicians care about what you think, but I'm saying that they also care too much about their job. It's the people that are willing to sacrifice everything to get your point across that are good leaders. It's not the person that's like, well, I was elected because I'm a Democrat, but I think I think everyone thinks this is a better idea. That's not a leader. It, you need someone that's actually going to hear what you have to say. No one likes to be ignored, and yet we're ignored every day. So something I think is we need reform of three things. Reform of education. Stop making cuts and start saving the future. Reform leadership. 
Start teaching students how to be leaders, not be followers. Start teaching them to be creative. Don't crush their dreams and reform the government, which might be the hardest thing. We need to try to reach bipartisanship. As difficult as that may be, George Washington was entirely opposed to the idea of parties. And people think of him as this great person, and he was. So why don't we listen to him? So here's a couple of things that I think we probably ought to do, must do. And one of them is to always allow the free flow of information. It's better for everyone. I mean, does anyone think that if, you, if censorship is a good thing? Um, it can be beneficial in some certain senses, but then you're, you're manipulating people. You're manipulating people. You're manipulating what they know. And people complain about China doing that all the time. And why, why do people complain about it? Because it's not good. And then something that a lot of people don't want to do is work harder and make sacrifices. It's where other nations beat the US. They work longer hours and work more for less. Obviously, quality is better than quantity, but if you have more quality and more quantity, it's not really a problem. Leaders are going to have to say that you have to work. And it's sort of where Greece is having trouble. Because recently with the Greece Austerity Plan, that's what leaders want the people of Greece to do, to work harder for less pay in order to make the nation, str in order to make the nation stronger. And I know that it's, it's difficult to assume that people are going to work harder just because you want them to. And so that's where I think we have, we have to fix education and we have to fix leadership. I'm not saying that there's anything particularly wrong with what's going on now, but I'm saying that in 20, 30 years, we're going to have a problem. So, it's time to fix education. We are the next scientists. I'm talking to the kids here. We are the next scientists, politicians, diplomats, doctors, Nobel laureates, Rhodes Scholars, MacArthur Fellows. It is our time to revolutionize the world. We have to start somewhere, and education is a, place, is a good place to start. Education is where we are being beaten. People around the world are starving, and most of them not for food. They're starving for your job. They're starving for your education. If we want to see America reach the ripe old age of 250, we need reform, we need better education, and we need people with passion who care and will pour their hearts out. We need quality workers, and that can be best achieved through a better education. If there's anyone out there with a the mentality that anything different or any change is bad, be prepared to fail. We need to change things or the destination of the course that we're currently on it's not pretty. But just because this TEDx Youth event ends does not mean you forget everything that's said here, even if you disagree with me. You have to go out and help share the message. If you see someone not caring, inspire them. Some analysts say that we're sending too many kids to college. Maybe they're right. Or maybe there's nothing wrong with sending too many kids to college. How does one define too many? When unemployment is too high? Should we spend time de-educating people so they'll create a permanent lower class? Currently, that's the path we're headed, and maybe that's not the worst idea. But there are always other solutions. People don't want to have to work hard. At the small things, to make them perfect, but I'm saying to you kids out there, to you teenagers, to you people in college, to anyone that can make a difference, anyone, that if your parents, teachers, and bosses aren't willing to do it, you need to stand up and say, I will. Thank you.